Computer Network from Middlesex University in 2006. Mr. Cheta Nwanze, you are most welcome to the African Leadership Group, the Nigerian Leadership Series, today's edition. We're happy to have you here and um, thank you for accepting to speak on this forum. The African Leadership Group strives to promote good and sound leadership across Africa, starting with Nigeria, where we are a little bit domiciled for now. But the important thing is to make sure that there's great leadership in Africa and to make sure that we have the right leaders in place for the future of this great country. So maybe my first question is, what is SBM intelligence? Uh, what really is it and who is behind SBM intelligence and what is it supposed to achieve? I know it's a think tank that focuses on geopolitics and socioeconomic issues, but you may want to add a few more things to that. Thank you. You are most welcome. Okay, thank you for having me. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. You're welcome. Um, straight to the question. Um, SBM Intelligence is, uh, as we've said, it's a geopolitical uh, research organization. Um, it was started by myself and uh, uh, two other partners um, nine years ago now. And um, we started it because we noticed um, two of us were coming from media houses and we noticed that there was a gap in analysis um, on the level that uh, you had um, when you have organizations such as um, Stratfor in the US or the uh, Oxford Analytica in the UK, that nexus between politics and the economy. Um, up until that time, um, a lot of people were not seeing that political decisions impacted on their economic lives. Um, so that is something that we've been trying to um, make people understand that when you have policy failures, eventually the economy will be will be affected. I mean, just today, we saw um, basically record inflation um, being announced for Nigeria. And you can easily trace the inflation, the inflationary pressures that we're facing to bad policy decisions. And for the record, I think um, the current governments, even though they've made a lot of mistakes, they get a bad rap. But it must be stated that um, that's Nigeria's inflation problem has been a problem since 1960, more or less. Um, we have a situation where it's only 25% of the time since our independence day, or our independence day that we've had single digit inflation. We've basically been tracking on double digit inflation since. Um, this is essentially the very nature of the governments, the very nature of the Nigerian states. Um, and this is basically what we're talking about today. So once again, thank you for having me. Thank you, Cheta, and thank you for that um, introduction. Yeah, I must confess that I myself, even as an accountant, for a long time could not connect politics and economy. And uh, even as a Christian, we all said to ourselves, uh, politics is dirty, leave these politicians to do their politics. Let us face our God and those of us who are professionals, let us face our profession and let us work hard and make our money mm -hmm. and leave the politicians to destroy or mess themselves up. Even my own elder brother is a lawyer. And uh, in 1999, he says, well, we've done our best. We've brought in democracy. Let's leave the politicians to do their job. And we all, we all, we all uh, uh, in pain. We're all in pain for it right now, in deep and sincere pain. Now, let me ask you a question. Buhari, Muhammadu Buhari, our president, I uh, read it in a couple of places. He says he has done well. In fact, in, uh, in uh, Enugu yesterday or so, he says he doesn't understand what all the fuss is about, that why can't Nigerians accept that he has done well? He doesn't understand why they're complaining. Number one, I'm going to ask you a pointed question. Has he done well? That's question number one. And then question number two is you said for most of the time in Nigeria, we've had double-digit inflation 
and so on and so forth. Why is that? Those are my two questions for the moment. Okay. Um, the, the question on whether Buhari has done well, I think that answers itself. Um, no, the president has not done well. Um, to be fair to him, um, he does believe genuinely that he has done well. And that speaks to the nature of the Nigerian states. Um, the Nigerian state runs a very Byzantine operation where it makes every effort to shield the man at the top from the reality of the situation on the ground. So a lot of um, the civil servants around, well, well civil servant just being a, a catch word, I, would, I think the, the better word is functionaries. A lot of the functionaries around the person of uh, President Buhari actually shield him from the day-to-day from the -day realities. And I think that a very good example would be when the guards brigade was attacked, the statements that he made shows genuine surprise. He was actually genuinely surprised that um, such an attack would happen so close to the presidential villa and that people would dare to engage the guards brigade, which is probably the best equipped unit in the Nigerian military, um, it, that people would dare to engage them in a firefight. So that's single, those little incidents such as that, um, you can't really call it little because human beings died, but incidents such as that essentially give you a window into what is happening in, in and around the person of the president. And it's not just um, President Buhari. Um, good Dr. Jonathan suffered the same thing. If we go all the way back to Shehu Shagari, um, Shehu Shagari, if we remember, released a lot of money to um, for people to start constructing Abuja when back when Nigeria's capital was still Lagos, but Abuja had started being built. And there was a visit that he made to Abuja. I think this was in 1981 or 1982. I don't remember the exact year. And he was shocked to see, and he asked a question. He said, where are all the buildings? That is a window into the kind of system that we have run, basically. And it goes even all the way back to colonial times. Think of how our grandfathers, um, when they were children and the district commissioner was coming to visit, everybody was made to, it was then that everybody swept the, the village square. It was then that everybody um, uh, wore their Sunday best for the visit of the district commissioner. So basically we we built a culture of making sure that things look good when the big man is coming. We don't want him to know that there are problems. Um, so many people who are at the top of the, the pyramid in, in the Nigerian sense um, do not understand or do not know that within the domains that they supervise that there's a genuine problem because if a lot of people around them hide it, go to great lengths, not just hide it, but go to great lengths to hide it from them. Um, so to your second question as to how, why we have double digit inflation, it's, it's very simple. The fundamentals are poor. Um, I think that one of the things that we should always look at is an example I can give is in the Western world on certain days, you have days such as Black Friday, which is a major shopping day. Everything comes down because the efficiencies are there in their supply chains to make sure that goods are delivered as and at when due. In our own case, it's the reverse. When we're coming towards festive seasons, prices go up because we have inefficient systems. So the double digit inflation that we've basically um, lived under since independence, like I said earlier, it's only 25% of the time that we've not had, that we've had single digit inflation in, in Nigeria. The, that kind of um, living is as a result of systemic inefficiencies. For example, our road networks are really poor. So which means that you cannot guarantee that goods will be at location on time. Then the one, the big elephant in the room, policy decisions. When you have uncertain policy uncertainty, which is something that has been a constant in Nigeria, you will have people hedging. You will have people making sure, uh, doing things to make sure that they can protect their own wealth, those who can. And such things lead to inflation. Um, I've talked about infrastructure. It's not just roads, electricity, everything, because this affects perishables. And increasingly, as people are now seeing politics, because security, 
Um, so back in October 2015, SBM Intelligence published a report called Terror in the Food Baskets. Um, at the time, SBM was still a very small organization. So I used to go to the field as well to personally interview people. And we interviewed people in the middle belt who, as of May 2015, when we were doing that field work, had not been to their farms for going on two to three years. And in the report, we said, this thing is going to begin to show up in food prices further down the line. When that report was published, a lot of people called us all sorts of names, alarmists, um, that were even accused of being funded by the CIA to destabilize Nigeria and all of that. But now it is clear to everybody, basically the security incidents in Nigeria's north, the food growing regions of the country, are beginning to have an effect in food prices in places like Lagos. Um, something that tends to shock people a lot is the fact that there's more fish or traditionally more fish is produced in the Northeast than in the South South, even though the South South has the coastline. But because of the Boko Haram insurgency, fish production in the Northeast has really gone down. This has affected protein output. And these things have a long-term effect in the, in the fact that protein is very important for children growing up. If we, if we don't have enough protein to feed our children, then ultimately it will show up in our academics. All of these things push on as um, bad policy decisions, security, they have long-term effects. Um, another example I can give is the policy on um, the CBN's uh, um, imports exclusion list. When you have these items that, are, that you cannot get foreign exchange for in order to import them, what is the, the function of importation? Importation is to fill in the gaps. Um, rice being the most infamous or the most popular. Nigeria's rice um, production has never met up with consumption, at least since 1977. We published a chart sometime last year that showed it from 1960 up until 2021. And it was clear that from the moment the Land Use Act was, was promulgated, basically rice production began to fall behind rice consumption. You have to ask the question, why? And it's this simple. There's only so much that big capital will come to invest in your agricultural se uh, sector if they don't have certainty about land tenureship, land holding. So policy decisions have an effect on inflation, which ultimately has an effect on people's lives. I hope I've answered the question properly. Yeah, to some extent, I think you have. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chieta. Uh, you are going to answer two questions for me again. Uh, well, you've answered one, so don't let me bother. Don't let me take you back. Uh, accessing a divided country. So, uh, in your opinion, you think our country is divided? Mm -hmm. And along what lines do you think it is divided? And... Um, so what, what are the divisions? That's one. And then two, uh, ANAP did a poll recently and they've been scoring the candidates and they think one or two candidates are ahead of the others. I don't know if you saw that poll and if any of your own analysis is reflective of, of what they have said. But essentially, I want you to please explain to me uh, if you think our, company, our country is really divided and along what lines? And then I'm going to be asking my co-presenter, Jumoke Akin Taylor, who is out there in, uh, San, in the Bay Area in California, to also ask you a couple of questions after you have answered this one. Thank you. OK, thank you again for the questions. Nigerians are divided. There is no, um, there is no doubt about it. Um, I think that any group of human beings will always be divided. And you now need certain things to actually stress the commonalities and bring unity um, among that group of people. So what are the lines along which Nigerians are divided? The two big ones that everybody tends to look at are ethnicity and religion. But we're also divided by wealth. Um, income inequality is a real thing in Nigeria. So let's start with ethnicity, which is, um, I think, the most fundamental dividing line. Um, I think it's important to stress that Nigeria 
it's an artificially cre created country. It's our reality. Um, we should, it's not something that we should run from. Nigeria was created to balance the books at the British colonial office back in 1906. That was when um, George Goldie issued a, a memo regarding the, um, the, the merger of the Northern Protectorates, the Southern Protectorates, and the colony of Lagos. So the colony of Lagos was first merged with the Southern Protectorates before the full amalgamation took place eight years later. It was done to balance the books. It wasn't done in consultation with the people who occupied the territory. And for a very long time, um, um, the British had to use a lot of violence to bring these people to accept that they were part of one country. But the British did not make any efforts to create a nation. Rather, they made every effort to divide the peoples in the country that they had created. And it's a very simple, um, uh, simple calculus. You can't blame the British. They were not in Nigeria because they loved us. They were in Nigeria to make a profit. That's what empires do. And empires, historically, always do divide and rule. So prior to 1910, there's no recorded incident of a Yoruba versus Igbo thing. It just doesn't exist. But suddenly, we're in a situation where it appears, or some people would want to paint it, that the Yorubas and the Igbos cannot stand each other. That's problematic, but that is a creation of the colonial master. When we are too busy pointing fingers at each other, fighting ourselves, then we will not be able to face up to the real, um, to the real enemy, as it were. It's again, I would keep stressing, it's basic. Um, now that we understood this was, and I think maybe it's it's best to, to give a story because this um, this um, this anecdote tells you exactly the structure of Nigeria, how it works. Um, in 1928, towards the end of 1928, the women in the area around um, Aba Opobo um, uh, in, uh, in, re in River State, uh, uh, what is now called River State, in what is now called Abia State, and Ikotabasi, in what is now called Akwaibom, protested the imposition of extra taxes on them. The Warren's chief who was responsible for the area escalated the situation. Again, it's one of the problems of Nigeria. Many of our leaders do not have legitimacy in the eyes of their people. Um, it's something that has been a problem then. It's still a problem till today. So the world's chief at the time, um, uh, Okubo, escalated the situation. And before you know it, the district commissioner got involved. Now, unlike in other colonies such as Kenya, where the British were directly involved in administration, in, in most of what is now Nigeria, they, pr they practiced indirect rule. Um, they did, Nigeria was never a settler colony, um, in, unlike, say, again, Kenya or South Africa. So eventually, the, Brit the district commissioner got involved and ordered his men to shoot the protesters. And the men refused. Um, now, why did the men refuse? You look at the very structure of the Nigerian police. Prior to 1930, the Nigerian police ran as four different units. You had the Northern Constabulary, which was, which was responsible for the Northern region. You had the Niger Delta Constabulary, which coincided roughly with what is now called the South South and the South East, with the exception of Edo. You had the Western Constabulary, which um, uh, coincided, coincided roughly with today's Southwest and Edo. And then you had the, Lagos, the Colony Constabulary, which covered Lagos. These police forces drew policemen from the local population. And it's a simple thing. When, if you go to the UK, for example, you have the Metropolitan Police in London. You have, if you go up to um, say Aberdeen, you have the Grampian Police. If you go to Manchester, you have the Mancunian Police. Policing is, a, is local. Um, if you go to the United States, you have the New York City Police Department, you have the LAPD, you have the San Francisco Police Department. Policing is a local thing. Basically, to be a successful police operation, to have a successful police operation, you need to have local knowledge in of the place, not um, this situation that we have where essentially foreigners are brought to police somewhere. So when the order was given to shoot the protesters, they didn't, the police people did not shoot the uh, Niger Delta policemen. 
Why? Because they would eventually have to face their own people. Why did you kill your women? So eventually a cable was sent to Lagos and policemen were dispatched. And so the protest went on for, I think between four and five days while those policemen were on routes. So back in those days, they had to go by, they had to go by boats from Lagos um, all the way to, uh, to birth at Opobo. These policemen who were brought in were Yoruba speaking, did not speak any of the three languages that were dominant among the women who were protesting, um, that's Igbo, um, Ibibio, and, um, uh, and Ijo. So they couldn't understand, and crucially, they did not feel kinship to those women. The colonial authorities tended to keep documentation, which is something that we've, we've kind of begun to fail at, so for, or we've been failing us for a while. So you can still access a list of the people who were killed in the Abba women's protests or, or the Abba women's war, depending on who you are speaking with. The authorities called it a riot in order to delegitimize it. One thing that, that I always find very interesting is when I listen to English media, the language is their own, so they know how to use their language as a tool. Calling it a riot delegitimizes it, whereas those women were protesting for something very legitimate, the imposition of um, unfair taxes. However, back to the story, when you look at the list of those who were killed, 51 people were killed, 50 women who came from different places in the old eastern provinces, ranging from somebody who came from Asaba to somebody who came from Calabar. The one man who was killed was a policeman called Alimi, who came from the southwest. When you consider that as of 1929, the nation Nigeria, the country Nigeria was just 14 years old. All the people who were killed were older than Nigeria, including the policemen, including the 50 women. They did not feel a sense of nationhood towards one another. The lesson that the colonial authorities took from that was to begin to mix up the police force. So it was, it's not an accident that the year following, the, uh, in 1930, the Nigerian police was merged into a single unit. And crucially, they began to deploy policemen outside their regions of origin and began to house them in barracks away from the population. It achieved two things. The first, the police was, was separate from the people, which um, brought to the second thing, made them an effective tool of suppression of the people. So rather than the police to be there for um, uh, to help solve crimes, help protect the people, the police essentially turned into a tool of suppression. We have maintained that security architecture till this day. Since then, so in 1960, when the, the British withdrew and Nigerians took over, rather than sit down and look at that architecture, we maintained it. So it's not an accident when you see all of the state-sponsored massacres that have happened on Nigerian soil since independence in 1960 have been, the, the, have been commanded by people who were not indigenous to the place where it was happening in. Because our, our security architecture calls for people to move away from their region of origin. They do not feel kinship to the people. And that fundamental story of kinship is one that we have not answered, kinship and indigenship. A lot of people call, for example, the 1966, the first coup that's, um, that truncated democracy, say it was an evil coup. But people don't know or don't seem to conveniently forget that Unzeogo was, was just Igbo in name only. His first language was Hausa. He was born and brought up in Kaduna. Indeed, his name was Kaduna. This is something very fundamental that we need to answer. I was born and brought up in Edo states, but I know I cannot go to Edo state to say I want to run for governor. We need to answer that question. Why not? Because the, the longer we feel to answer that question, the more divided we will be. Where ironically, a, a class of Nigerians is emerging through intermarriage that are really Nigerian. Take me again as an example. I'm an Igbo guy. I'm married to a Yoruba woman. 
if we break the country, where do my kids go? That's a question that we need to ask. But unfortunately, we have again built a culture where we are adverse to answering tough questions. We seem to want to bury our heads in the sand and hope that the um, that the questions go uh, go away. They won't. They will come back with a vengeance each time we avoid them. Now, to your second question about the ANAP polls, I've seen the results. I think that the results are a reflection of people's opinion as is, especially considering the methodology that, uh, that NOI polls uses. NOI polls tend to use the phone, so they will tend to speak with people who are um, in the middle class of society. In that, in that way, and that's for me, that's a weakness of the poll. In that way, what you, you would see is that it's the aspirational class that's responded to that poll. And from what I can see, um, asking questions around and all of that, a lot of the aspiration, aspirational classes think that Peter Obi is the best candidate. I have my doubts about Peter Obi, I've written about them, but I have my doubts about all the candidates I've written, those, I've written about those doubts. Um, I, I suspect that if we were to have a boots on the ground poll that spoke with rural Nigerians, we may see something slightly different. I also suspect that on election day, because this is something that most of us um, in the middle to upper classes seem to forget, the average Nigerian is dirt poor. So I suspect that politics of money will play a role on election day. It's unfortunate, but I think that's where we still are. Um, thank you. I believe. Good evening, Mr. Cheetah Jumoke here. How are you today? I'm good. You? Okay. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time to give this presentation. Um, my question is, someone had posted something in the chat that we tend to blame, um, not blame or point fingers at the colonial master for uh, this contraption we call Nigeria. And my question is, before Nigeria was formed, all these different ethnic groups were coexisting somehow, right? They were neighbors. Geographical locations did not change. The Yorubas were in, they were where they were and all the different ethnic groups were geographically located and then we came together as Nigeria. But there was peace amongst all these groups before Nigeria was formed. So you've pointed to some of the issues um, that is causing the division. Do we have records of the different events that have occurred that has um, really caused this major division? You, you mentioned the ABA, I don't want to call it riot because you thought it was diminishing the effect of it, but there were a lot of occurrences that happened over time that is leading to this division. Do we have like a, a record of the different ones in the different, in the different regions? that may have led to the division in Nigeria? Yes, there are records. And I think it's important to point out something. Again, unfortunately, too many of us don't um, understand our history. So for a start, the Yoruba identity, as we know it today, did not exist prior to colonialism. It was colonialism that's, um, that's more or less created and strengthened it. The Igbo, the Igbo identity that we know today did not exist prior to colonialism. And they were not sitting together and singing Kumbaya. Um, the Yorubas were come, or what we know as the Yorubas today, were, were on the tail end of a long series of wars, the Kiriji Wars. Um, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce um, the name of the first newspaper in Nigeria. Um, it was written in, in Yoruba, um, lest I murder the language, but it translated to newspapers for the Ebas and the Yorubas. That's what it's translated to, the first newspaper in, in Nigeria. When you look at things from the point of view of a historian or a political scientist, that says a lot. It say, what it says is that the Eba people at that time considered themselves to be separate from the Yorubas. The same thing, if you look at the history of Abel Kuta, you look at the history of, um, of how the British conquered the areas around the Kurudu, the British essentially played people one against the other who did not see themselves as the same. And this same thing was repeated in Igbo land. 
um, one of the best, even though it's fictionalized, one of the best historical records of, um, of the Igbo people is Chino Achebe's Things Fall Apart. Essentially, he puts together a lot of stories that he was told as a child and fictionalized them. So you can actually see um, that, so in Things Fall Apart, he talked about the destruction of Abami. And in the destruction, the destruction, destruction of Abami made communities around that area to come to a decision as to who would work with the, with the white man, who would not work with the white man. Abame is a is an allegory for Asaba. Asaba was destroyed by the British in 1888 or by, by the Royal Niger Company because at the time it was the Royal Niger Company that just had a charter from the British government. So it wasn't operating as the British government. And following that destruction of Asaba, a lot of communities in the Umbala River Basin, which is what we now call Anambra, began to basically decide who we'll, would we'll surrender to the white man, who we'll fight against the white man. All of these things eventually led to what was called Aya Ekumeku, the Ekumeku War. And the Ekumeku War was the longest resistance, organized resistance to British rule um, in the area that became Nigeria. It ended just before the start of the First World War in 1914. And the British had to pursue a scorched earth policy in that region. And it's important to go through this history because I think to answer something that I've seen in the chats, I am not blaming the British for all our woes. Oh, come on, we've been, we are more than capable of having added to our woes by ourselves. And we have indeed added. But the truth is when the foundation is faulty, and very faulty. There's only so much you can build on top of it. The foundation, and it's not just of Nigeria, but of most African countries, has been very faulty. It's not in Nigeria that the statement was made that, um, that every election is an ethnic head count. It was in another African country. As a matter of fact, two other African countries, Kenya and, surprise, surprise, Ghana. So, we all have these issues. They, they are there. And knowing where we are coming from, knowing what was brought, what brought about where we are, will help a long way in knowing how to untangle that knot and move forward. Um, again, pointing out um, that there was peace among the groups before Nigeria was formed, it's not true. The, the Fulani Jihad right, that was started by Usman Nampudu in 1804, essentially was uh, lasted up on uh, for another, um, it started in 1804, lasted for about 26 years, effectively ended in 1826. But the Fulani kept moving, going for um, slave raids in other, um, in other lands, the thief were consistently fighting with the Fulani. And there's a school of thought that says that Usman Danfudu was not killed in, uh, that did not die in, uh, at, at an old age peacefully in Sokoto, but that he was killed during a raid on Thief lands. Whether that is true or not, we will never know. What is certainly true is that when the British came along, they did not have problems recruiting people from the Thief, from the Nupe, from the Igbira, in order to fight and subdue the Fulani. That says a lot. It says a lot about where we were before the British came. Um, thank you. I'm going to ask just one, one more question and then I'll hand over to Pastor Sonny. So you, you were talking about assessing the this divided nation and we do understand um, that we do have uh, a lot of issues along ethnic and tribal lines, but what is the way forward? Um, you, talk, you talked about you know, where would your children go if Nigeria breaks up? I think there are a lot of us in that situation where we are from different regions, our parents have come together and then we, we are products of uh, multi-ethnic and even multi-religious group in, in Nigeria. So how do we begin to chart this path for reconciliation? How do we come together as a nation to say, well, this is how we heal? Uh, these are some of the issues or the mistakes that were made. A lot of us were not there when um, the, 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 the British came together and formed this nation, Nigeria, but we find ourselves here. How do we begin to heal as a nation and move forward together as a nation? And people talk about breakup. 
what 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 will that look like um, if we do break up into how many groups are we going to break break into? Just wanted you to speak a little bit about that, and then I'll hand over to Pastor Sunny. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, personally, I don't think that a breakup will solve anything. Um, I think that a breakup would only worsen things um, because, again, unlike say it will return to before uh, before the before they were brought together by um, after the Russian Revolution, we don't. Um, the closest that we have to nations um, uh, of antiquity. Um, would be the would be the Sokoto Empire, the Sokoto Caliphate, and the Bini Empire. Um, the Oyo Empire was further back along the line, and as of the time that the British brought us together, the um, the Oyo Empire had been fighting among themselves for decades. Again, like I, I mentioned earlier, the Kiriji Wars. So that is problematic, to say the least. Secondly issues of identity. So among my own Igbo people, you have people, for example, people from Ebony states who have issues with the rest of us. You have people from the Anioma region of Delta states who refuse to identify as Igbos. Some of them I, I refuse to identify, some of them I identify. You have um, people from, um, from, the, uh, from the Wawa area, Unsuka and around all those parts who the other Igbos will say, oh, they're carnish. They don't, nobody, uh, nobody likes them. So where do you start with that? Having said that, um, I think two very quick anecdotes will, will suffice here. First, um, in 2015, um, the, sometime in October 2015, I was in New Orleans in, in um, the US. And I had a, a long discussion with a white supremacist who was a member of what they call the Louisiana National Guard. And he kept saying that he believed that Louisiana would have been better off if it had not been a part of the United States. And I was shocked to hear that. But it gave me an insight. You will always have those people who believe that division is better. However, you have to win the arguments. So the second story is about Europe. Between the fall of Constantinople in 1453 and the end of the Second World War, there is 400 and um, I think that's 492 years or something. Yeah, 492 years. In that period, there have been 70, uh, there were 70 wars thereabouts, essentially a war every decade on European soil. Since the end of the Second World War till now, eight decades, there has been no war in Western Europe. And why is that? In 1948, the Americans started the Marshall Plan, which interconnected Europe and brought Europe trading with one another. France and Germany had fought three wars between 1871 and 1945. Nowadays, the very first foreign visit that the French president makes is to Berlin. The very first foreign visit that the German chancellor makes is to Paris. They are that tight. It's economic integ integration. If we improve our infrastructural situation and get to trade with one another in Nigeria. And Nigeria is big enough. Nigeria is a huge country with things that people need from all parts of Nigeria. The Southeast cannot go it alone. The Southeast cannot feed itself. And this was proven devastatingly during the war. We can't feed ourselves in the world. So we need to be able, and the reasons are geographic. The reasons are physical. There's nothing you can do about it. So you need to be able to trade to get what you want. So when you have such a thing and people begin to trade with one another, a people who trade will not fight. A people who do not trade will eventually fight. So I believe that it is the economy. If we start having well thought out and smart economic policies, eventually the temperature in Nigeria will calm down and everything will be calm. To paraphrase Bill Clinton, is the economy stupid? Thank you so much. Uh, Pastor Sonny. Um, thank you very much, um, Jumoke. Um, Cheta, good evening and good welcome evening, to our platform. Um, Thank you very it's much. great to have you on the platform, and very soon we will open up the space for people to 
sort of engage you with questions. Um, but permit me to go back to the very beginning where you said that Nigeria is divided majorly along two um, major lines. The, the, default, the default lines are religion and ethnicity. Um, you also major mentioned the income inequality, which is another source of division. I think what we want to try and do is apart from assessing the division is to say, we recognize that these are things that constantly divide us. However, how can it be breached? Because what we see in Nigeria today is that people are foiling those division, exploiting it, and um, everybody is falling back. Today, people would rather call themselves a Yoruba man, Hausa man, and Igbo man than call themselves Nigerian. I mean, when we were growing up in the 70s, that was, um, we identified more with Nigeria. We sang the national item. We are proud to carry the flag. Today, all that is dying down a bit. So going back to originally what you said, I want to know, so yeah, we have this basic division. Number one, what is foiling it? Why are people failing to see themselves as one and going to those devout lines and what can be done? It's scarcity. It's, simp it's simply scarcity. What okay. is foiling the division? We are fighting for resources. So let me give an example. Um, with the pastoral conflict, the whole Fulani headsman thing that is happening. Nigeria did a census um, of cattle back in 1960. And um, I'm trying to, I'm struggling to remember the, the exact figures, but we had, um, uh, I, think, I think it was, uh, it was 8 million head of cattle thereabouts in 1960. As of that 1960 as well, all of Nigeria was available. The 100,000 square kilometers that makes up the country was available for grazing. There wasn't as much developments um, that's cut through grazing routes and all of that. And the full and cattle headers were seen as benign passers-by in most parts of the country. As a matter of fact, they are passing through helped with farming because the, the residue left by the cattle was used as fertilizer in many places. Fast forward, um, so this cattle survey I talked about, sorry, was not in 1960, it was in 1976. Fast forward to 2006, 30 years later. The NBS did an estimate of how many cattle we had, how many head of cattle and we had 19.8 million head of cattle. So the number of cattle had more than doubled in 30 years, but crucially, the land available to those cattle had shrunk. Development, desertification, whatever else you want to mention, the land available had shrunk to about 62% of what was available back in 1976. What that means in stark economic terms is scarcity. There is, there is more, there, there are more cattle to feed, but less lands to feed them. And that's it essentially leads to more conflicts. And this, this, um, this uh, allegory can be repeated in every part of the country where you have more mouths to feed. As of independence, our population was officially 47 million. Today, our population is officially about 206 million or 206 or 213, depending on who you want to speak with. The pop I don't believe those population figures, but what is certain and what I cannot argue with is that our population has exploded in the time between independence and now, but the resources have shrunk. So Nigeria's GDP per capita has actually reduced from $2,800 thereabouts per person in 1980 to just over $2,000 today. $800 has been shaved off our GDP per capita in, in, 40, in 42 years. So that's what, is, what that means is that we are more people fighting over fewer resources. That's anywhere, anywhere in the world, that's a recipe for violence and human behavior. One thing I always like to tell people in the office, Nigerians are not special. We are human beings and we behave like human beings. The moment there's a scarcity of resources, the moment things are not as many as people expect, you will see people begin to fight each other and then begin to other the other so that they can find a way to cut out that other person from, um, uh, from, getting, from accessing what they want to access. 
it's human behavior. And then when you layer it on, uh, when you layer on top of that, the fact that unfortunately we have built a country where there are no consequences for bad behavior, nobody should be surprised at what we are saying today. So basically, if we want to turn this around, we need to find a way, and it's going to be very difficult. I'm not even going to, to pretend about that. It's going to be very difficult, but we need to find a way to start to make the law equal to all, number one. And then going back to what I started from, we need smart economic policies to make our country more productive again and very quickly. The moment we have more productivity, more people um, uh, uh, going to work every day, more people having something to take home to their families, we will see the temperature start coming down. Thank you. Um, so you seem to be echoing what one of the major presidential candidates is saying that the problem to solving the issues we have in Nigeria is production, production, production. Um, um, the issue is, um, do you think the current political class can turn things around in Nigeria? And you did say that you have issues with each of those candidates, including this one that talks about production, production, production. What is the way out? If these guys cannot get us around it, come 2023, are we still going to be moving around in the same circle? Unfortunately, I think that even after the 2023 elections, regardless of who wins, we are going to be moving around in the same circles. Um, the reason I think that is that our fiscal situation is disastrous, for want of a better word. Um, so in economic terms, whenever you look at economic indicators, you're not looking at a screen. You're looking at a window. And the window is a window into things that happened 18 months to three years ago, sometimes even more. They are called in, so the language for them in both economics and political science is uh, lagging indicators. Economic indices are typically lagging indicators. So the very high inflation that was announced today is as a result of decisions that were made two years ago. For example, the border closure. What that means is that over the next two to three years, things will get worse. Unfortunately, we have two things that will mitigate against sensible policies being, um, uh, being implemented. We've, for 50 years, we have pursued a policy single-mindedly or two policies where we equate the health of the economy with the value of the, the national currency to the US dollar. We have no control over the US dollar. So equating the health of our currency with the value of the US dollar is, or the health of our economy with the value with the exchange rate of our currency to the US dollar is at the very least a fool's errand. It's something we've been doing for 50 years odd and we are still doing it. The second thing is the price of petrol. We've built a scam with the petrol subsidy, but because we believe in our God-given right to have cheap petrol, we are unwilling to let go of that. Nigeria is in effect subsidizing petrol for the rest of West Africa. Um, in 2018 and then in 2020, um, we calculated the price of petrol around West Africa using the currency conversion rate to the US dollar at the time. Nigeria's petrol was 40 cents in 2018, in, and then in 2020, 2020, and then in 2022, because we, we published that same chart again, um, an updated version in February this year. 40 cents unchanged for three years. The cheapest close to us was um, Liberia, if memory serves me correct, at 62 cents. But our immediate neighbors, Benin at 79 cents, Niger at 97 cents, at Cameroon at one, uh, Cameroon at one dollar um, six cents. That is incentive. Any smart Alec can buy petrol in Nigeria if he finds a way to smuggle it across the border, 
he will, he will reap a healthy profit. And that explains why we keep having these ever ballooning cost of, um, of uh, 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 ballooning numbers of uh, uh, liters that the NMPC says we consume. People are making a lot of money from this arbitrage. Very unfortunately, if the next president comes in and tries to remove this subsidy, he's going to face social unrest. So when you have those kind of things, it's I'm not going to pretend that I have the solutions. I don't. I can only say, or oh, let me say, okay, let me rephrase. The solution is to fix the economy, but I don't know how to go about it. And I, I pray God will give us somebody who knows how to go about it because it's a very rough road, extremely rough, but that's where we are. And I think that things, are, things have to, by default, get a lot worse before they get better. Okay, that's, that's, that's good. Thanks for, for that. Um, I will soon open it up for questioning, but before we do that, let me just take you to one of the other um, factors that divide us in this country, and let me hear your opinion on that, if you have ever done any survey, is the issue of religion. Um, again, I go back to in the 70s when we were growing up, I grew up in the North, and um, we, we lived together harmoniously. Um, at Christmas and at Salah, you know, we shared food, we went to school together, there was never the issue of this boka or the hijab they wear. Everybody was okay. But progressively from the 80s, I have seen many riots. We had to relocate my mom from the north because in one of the riots, she had to be taken to the police college, you know, to, to house her there. We have seen many riots and progressively we have become very intolerant of each other's religion. What went wrong? How can it be fixed? Ah, that's a very tough one because there's, the honest truth is that there's no telling what a human being will do when he believes that God is, com is commanding him to do it. Um, there are two things that have contributed to the rising intolerance in religion uh, in Nigeria. Um, is the rise of a particular strain of Islam and at the same time, the rise of a particular strain of evangelical Christianity. And both of them began to make serious inroads into Nigeria pretty much after about the end of 1979. Um, something significant happened in the Muslim world that year, but at the same time, concurrently. So, some, so sometimes we must understand that we are at the center of a geopolitical uh, tectonic plate. So Nigeria sits on the geopolitical tectonic plate. If you ever get to read um, some, some what things clash of civilizations, that line runs through Nigeria and a lot of um, African countries where Christian and Muslim civilizations clash. Now, both religions can live with one another. This has been shown. Again, the, my mother grew up in Kano. The, the, um, the picture that you have painted of what it was like when you were growing up, they can live with one another. But one thing that we must be aware, and I think we've been deliberately blind to it for a very long time, is that within, this, the, within the core of the Abrahamic religions, there is a strain of intolerance. It's there. It, the seed is there. And it takes the right kind of preacher with the right kind with the right manner of charismatic um, uh, um, uh, of charisma for those um, for those strains to come out. That is what has happened in Nigeria. So consider Muhammad Yusuf, the founder of Boko Haram. By every account I have ever read of him, he was a very charismatic preacher very, very charismatic, but he preached intolerance. Now, here is one thing that was crucial. He ran a farm, a very large farm, around the Meduguri area. At a point when they left the Meduguri area to, and went uh, to um, the area in northern part of Yobe, around Dapchi, all those areas, they ran a huge farm, they ran a post office, they used some of the profits they made to buy motorcycles 
for people. Essentially, what was he doing? He provided his followers with jobs, something that the Nigerian state had failed to do. So he was concurrently delegitimizing the Nigerian state while he was legitimizing himself. Why won't such people follow him to the, to the end? So those are the kind of questions that we need to ask. What is it that as a state we have not done that leaves room for other people to do? Um, when Namdi Kano gave his first, uh, his first major interview after he was um, let go on bail, I was one who, um, who, who was the kind of middleman between uh, Kadiria Ahmed, Channels TV and IPOB. And Kadiria insisted that I follow them because number one, I was acting as a translator. And one of the things that I found quite impressive and annoying at the same time was the fact that on a Wednesday morning, because the interview was held on a Wednesday, on a Wednesday morning, there were 20,000 young Igbo boys outside of his house. For me, and I wrote about it shortly after, for me, that was indicative. Lack of jobs. Our unemployment rate is one of the highest. We've even stopped counting. But as of the last unemployment figures, we had the combined population of Belgium and Tunisia waking up every day in Nigeria not having anything to do. By any definition, that's a recipe for hate, that's a recipe for disaster. So when you add that toxic brew of ethnicity and religion, nobody should be surprised at what we're seeing in the country today. Not a politician. I won't ask you for that question about how you are going to solve it. So let me let you go. Um, Jumoke has a question. And um, as we come to the top of the hour, um, we'll be rounding out about 6.30. I will then take Samuel Dada, um, Otaje Faye, and Stephen Lawton. But before I do that, let Jumoke um, put in her question. Jumoke, go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Chita. You, you did mention... Um, economic integration as a way to bring us back together uh, as a nation or to make us more cohesive as a nation. So what would you, what are some of the strategies that you would propose if today you were made um, the, 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 the minister, you were made a minister, so what would be the strategy that you would propose for this economic integration? And you also mentioned uh, smart economic policies can you enlighten us a little bit about what, what, what that means and how we can make that work in Nigeria? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, tough question, it's some, something that we've given, we've debated extensively in the office. So let me um, give some of what we think would work. First things first, we need to count. That's the first thing. We need to have a proper census. Um, but we are painfully aware that a proper census is impossible as long as the incentive for inflation of population exists. Um, we still run a heavily centralized government that's, that, um, is the, uh, the, that shares uh, resources to people based on population, um, land size, and a few other esoteric factors. That needs to go out so that people will no longer have incentive to inflate their population figures. Once we have a proper account of how many Nigerians there are, then we will be able to actually begin to find things such as our comparative advantages. Um, we need to find ways to bring dollars into the country or whatever foreign currency. Bringing such will, will stop the bleeding. So we need to export. And export is not always goods. It can be services. We have a comparative advantage over India, for example, in terms of something like the, um, the call center business. We speak better English than the Indians, I dare say. And in terms of time zone, we're on the same time zone with Europe. We are six hours uh, in front of the Eastern Seaboard in America. So that means that if we have massive call centers in Nigeria, then we will be in a position to actually attend to problems in Europe and in North America. That's something that will bring in 
foreign exchange into Nigeria very quickly. Um, exporting of goods. We need to begin to export goods. A lot of people think that, oh, our market is, our internal market is big enough. It's not. The addressable market in Nigeria is actually very small. It's very tiny. They are not, it's not more than 37 million thereabouts. Um, so we need to start to export. And then once we start to export, we will build export discipline. The moment you have export discipline, the value of your goods begins to rise. And then you can begin to charge a premium. It is the way the Asians did it. It's, it's, it's what the Chinese are currently practicing with us. One of the, the more popular cars in there, uh, and even the Indians are beginning to practice it with us. There's this very popular car in, in Lagos that is being used now for Uber, the Suzuki Espresso. I will not enter that car on the pain of death because I have seen the end cap figures for that car. It's called a flat zero. Yet, the Indians are exporting it because it's manufactured in India. It's been exported to Nigeria in large numbers. They are using us to learn work. That's just it. So why can't we find somebody else to use to learn work? Okay. All right, Cheta. Um, thanks. Um, it's 6.03 now. I have four people that want to ask questions, and um, I will take them in this order. Um, I will ask that they go straight to the point, be very brief, and I hope Cheta also will be brief with his responses. So I will start with Samuel Dada. After Samuel will be um, Optaji Faye and then Stephen Lawansin and then Abayomi. Samuel, if you are still there, go ahead. Yeah, I'm there. Okay, yeah, I'm there. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for your submission. Um, I really so enjoyed it. Uh, well, the question is, do you think uh, we Nigerians have our identity as Nigerians? Because going by the history, when uh, we read that Aula all said, is just a mere geographical expression. So, and going by your own submission too, that we were being put together by the British. So it was like forcing multi-ethnic nations to come together. So we are not a modern nation. So that already tells us that we are divided as a people. So now, as years goes by, you know, the lies continues and people continue to defend their own territory. So it's not a matter of maybe we are divided now. Right from the foundation is faulty. So to me, I believe there's nobody is called a Nigerian. We don't have that identity as a Nigerian. Is it that we have an identity as an Hebrew man, Yoruba man, Nukwe man, whatever, whatever? But coming together, I think we need to rebuild that if we need to come together as a nation. So is there anyone in Nigeria can be, can be identified as a Nigerian, as an identity? Thank you. All right, thank you. Cheta, just hold it. Um, I hope you noted the question. Yes, I did. Otaji, go ahead and ask your question. Or your comments. Uh, all right, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, um, thank you, sir. Cheta, I just want to, I mean, you sound like, sound like um, a man who reads a lot. There's this book I stumbled on um, it's called The Trading States of the Oil Rivers. It was written by G.I. Jones spoke about the vivid accounts of the rise of the remarkable slave and palm oil trading states in the Niger Delta in the, 19th and, in the 18th and 19th century, um, which also analyzes the relation of political development to the economy as at that time. I would like to speak, if you have read that book, to speak briefly on how that event surrounding this trading state of oil rivers is affecting the Nigerian economy as of today. Um, then but my comment also is that personally I think one of the skills our president needs to have is called president. We need a president that can actually speak to the hearts of Nigerians for us to stop the trade and fight in order for us to build a one Nigeria so that we can carry the identity of Nigeria and and Hausa and Ibo or Yoruba or whatever ethnicity every other person is trying to uh, claim they are. So that's my comment and that's my question. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, um, Faye. Um, let me take Stephen Lawson. Is he there? Okay. If Stephen is not around, let me ask. Um, a bio me, Lori, to ask his question. 
Good evening, African Leadership Group. Thank you, Pastor Itra. All right. Uh, before my question or contribution, I will say um, a short prayer for St. God bless your intellect. I look at what you have said, and I, I believe that we have a tangible solution from the historical perspective you've given. And I look at it in this way. It's a contribution. If our history says that we are not one people, but we have um, lived a good life for a short period of time, let me say the time when we had the colonial masters and they gave us what would they called, um, is it indigenous or several? That's between 1946 and uh, let's say 1966, when we were practicing the legions. We were so, I think we were very economically viable then. So therefore we need to just go back, study what we were doing at those times from the historical perspective you mentioned, forget about all uh, the differences and see what was on ground then. What was on ground then? What was on ground then that you mentioned was that um, there was decentralization from what the British was trying to do. The four regions were producing and competing. So I now broke it down. If you look at it, maybe it will work into four perspectives. The economic integration through competition among the zones. Um, the second one is tourism and cultural exchange and competition again. And the fundamental one which I put as number three is the political structure. The political structure has to change back to what we had then in terms of being having a parliament or a confederation where people have a government at each region and the central government was not really, really what they were running after. Make the central government weak, make regional government, we could even have more than the six zones, make them have like a semi-government. And the fourth one is to have a common glory. Um, I want to use the United Kingdom. It, it, was, it was England that colonized us. Let's use where they come from. In the United Kingdom, a quick one. The United Kingdom people do not see themselves as one people. They know. It's only the outside world that see them as one people. The English man is different from the Scotch. The Scottish man is different from the Welsh. And the Irish man up from London Ireland do not see himself as an English man but they have a united common glory. So that should be what join us together. Let's have uh, maybe a parliament, whereby there's no king president, but just a first amongst the equal parliamentarian. And let's have economic disintegration, each zone managing themselves. That's my contribution. And I think uh, Sintas will be able to speak more on it as an idea. Thank right. you. Thank you, Abayomi. Um, Chita, have you had enough, or should I take the last person? Please, uh, let's take the last person. Adeswa Osime. Please go ahead, and I think um, those five questions should be enough for you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my question in the area of education, um, it really bothers me that we have so many people that um, are not educated or don't have understanding. And um, I think we really need to look into an educational system, the, the structure, the syllabus, whatever. Because I find that the young ones, the older ones, there isn't too much you can do. But the younger ones, we can catch them young, I believe. You know, I, I had an interaction with a young girl of five. I was doing simple um, multiplication, um, subtraction. She just couldn't understand it. She kept giving me the same answer of one, one, one. And the father was there laughing. And to me, I thought that, I said to myself, I don't think it's funny, you know? Which school is she going to? So please, I don't know what we can do because it really bothers me, especially up north. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Adesua. Um, Cheta, I think I'll hand over to you now um, to answer the questions, go ahead. Okay, I'll leave Adesua's question to the, uh, to the last um, because I think it's, it's extremely important and it's extremely frightening. Um, so we'll get back to that. Um, let's, let me start with the comments made by Abayomi uh, Iluri. Um, yes, our history states that we're not one, not one people, but nobody is in reality. 
Um, the modern nation state as we know it is just about, it's not up to 500 years old. Um, the modern nation state as we know it emerged after the peace of Westphalia, the 30 year war in Europe. Um, and when you come to think of it, really, which European country as we speak is not an ethno state? The UK, the United Kingdom, is the United Kingdom of Britain and Northern Ireland, colonized by the English who welded the Scots, the Irish, and the Welsh into one country. So you are right, they don't see themselves as one, but they were able to build a successful economy. And as long as they were on top of the world ruling, those differences did not matter. And that's what we need to understand. The differences will not matter when everybody's belly is full. Bob Marley said, them belly full, we are hungry. And a hungry man is an angry man. Very, very important. When the man is hungry, he will be angry. And that's when he will start looking for enemies behind every, every bush. That was, Nigeria is filled with angry people. Um, Otaji talked about... Uh, uh, Gwyneth Jones's book, uh, uh, Trading States of the Oil Rivers. Very, very, um, very, very interesting book. Very, very wonderful book. Um, it talked a lot about King Jaja, King, uh, King Kuku especially, um, but I think that it talked about them from the point of view of the foreigner. Having said that, there was something that I think he, he kind of missed in the book, which was that they were all suzerains of about Uranwe and Oba Adolo, Uranwe's father in Benin. The Benin Empire was built on the back of slave, the slave trade. And it continued holding its, uh, its uh, sovereignty um, over these guys. They were essentially vassals. Um, Nana of Ishakiri and the rest of them, they couldn't trade without the say so of Benin. Eventually, what led to the downfall of the Benin Empire was the fact that these guys ran into a stronger power who wanted to trade, namely the Royal Niger Company, wanted to colonize, uh, to monopolize trade along there. And the Benins will not have it. So the rest is history as to what's happened. But the key lesson to draw from there is that even before the British came, our people were trading with one another. The Igbo red cap that is so famous, that is practically the symbol of the Igbo man. Where does it come from? Has anybody bothered to ask about it? It came from somewhere. And my best guess is that it came from the area around Jimeta, which is in today's Adamawa states. Because back in those days, traders used to go up the river, river, uh, river and you know, turn at the confluence and then go up to Jimeta and trade. And they brought this cap. Where did the guys at Jimeta get the cap from? Have you noticed that the Kanuri have a very similar cap? It's just that it's a slightly different shade. And that in its, in its turn comes from the Turkish fairs. So trade has been happening. There was a time I was doing a lot of work into researching my family roots. And I found that my ancestors actually came from around the area called Ampa in Kogi State today. And I, I was able to secure a, a, um, an appointment with the AJ of Ampa, who is the traditional ruler of Ampa. Unfortunately, he passed away before we could see. But it's, I found it very, very interesting that my ancestral home, Nteje, which is in Anambra State, the root word is from AJ, AJ of Ampa. I found it very interesting. So we used to trade. We can trade. I think that trade is the way forward. And it ties into some of that that's question. Um, do we Nigerians have our identity as Nigerians? Is there somebody called a Nigerian now? I would say my son. He's a Nigerian. I may not necessarily be a Nigerian. I, I mean, I'm an Igbo guy. But my son, who is is uh, the son of an Igbo guy and a Yoruba lady, are, or is a Nigerian. 
And there are a lot of people like that. There's, and there's, it's just that we haven't done this survey scientifically um, at SBM, but we've been doing it sort of informally over the last few years. And I dare say, of course, we're not going to publish it until we do it scientifically. So I, I would appreciate if it's kept within this closed group. But I dare say that the ethnic group that we know as the Orobo will disappear as we know it in another two generations. Because we are seeing signs that a majority of young Urobos are not marrying Urobo people. They're marrying from other ethnic groups. What that means is that the identity called Nigerian is emerging. And it is not the first time this is happening in history. There was a time when the man from Westphalia would say that him and the man from Bavaria are very different human beings. But today they're all Germans. So this thing happens. The, my only fear or my main fear is that within the larger geopolitical context, within the larger global geopolitical context, we might be seeing a situation where in global terms, authority is moving back to the default, which is city states, even in the Western world. So you have, so, I mean, this, this has already happened in places like Colombia and Mexico, it's happening at some extent to some extent in Nigeria. But even in the Western world, you see, for example, in the UK, um, the prime city by far is London. And then every other place is secondary to London. The US is a huge, it's a continent. So, but even the US is you are seeing some prime cities, uh, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, um, Dallas, and Houston. And the rest are increasingly playing second fiddle. That's the default state of things. Who can, who can tell if, if national governments continue to lose authority towards this, uh, to these cities, maybe, just maybe we'll go back to, this, to the era of the city states. So finally, and this one I have to balance properly because it's, it's um, devastating. And this was question on education. I don't even know where to start because that is tragic. And that, is, um, that one gives me a lot of sleepless nights. We've done work for UNICEF. We've done work for the Federal Ministry of Education. So I know that the numbers are not very good. Um, just last Tuesday, just this uh, Monday past, we published a chart which came from the, um, the uh, NBS and UNICEF uh, multiple indicator cluster survey. 25% of school age children, primary school age children in Nigeria are not in school. That singular statistic should keep all of us awake every night. But there's another statistic not often talked about that should keep all of us awake. You can't close your eyes again, which is that 84% of people who go to who start out in junior secondary school do not make it to senior secondary school. There's a drop off, a huge drop off between junior and senior secondary school. That's about age 14. People are dropping out of the educational system at about age 14. Those people do not die, they grow. In 10 years' time, they will be unemployable and poor and angry what will happen to us those of us on this seminar when those guys come of age it's a question all of us need to be asking ourselves routinely i look at all the brouhaha around asu and i'm like this is not where the problem is the problem is 10 years before asu because what happens is that by the time these people, these children, these youths get to university level, they are already damaged. The problem is in, is in basic education. How do we fix basic education? And we're not asking that question. We're not asking that question. It keeps me awake. I see it. I'm able to provide a decent education for my children. 
But each time I get into my car to drive from Magudu to Victoria Island, I see children who don't have those basics in Lagos. And one thing we must keep in mind is that Lagos is different from the rest of Nigeria. It's worse out there. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, it's um, education is something that um, I think um, is, we should all really be concerned and worried about. And um, I can see how the tone went down when it was time to speak to the education matter. Um, I have one more person, Stephen Lawson. I'm sorry, I didn't take you earlier on. Um, I will take you and then Cheta can begin to wrap up with his closing remark. But I think uh, there's a question in the chat that I will ask also. Stephen, if you are there, please ask your question now. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, Pastor Sonny. Uh, Cheta, um, thank you very much for honoring this invitation. I have a um, a series of questions, so I'm just going to go straight to the point. One, what is your view about the strengths and the weaknesses of the three major uh, contenders for 2023, which is Peter, Obi, Atiku, and Tinimbo? Number two, of recent, uh, COP uh, had a press conference with regards to um, voters' um, registers' uh, allegation as the case might be. And this obviously was followed with a press um, release from INEC. Should we be concerned or be worried about an INEX position with regards to 2023? Number three, uh, there is a rumor that 2023 election might not hold. This is as a result of the insurgency or the insecurity uh, as the case might be. What is your thought or position about this? Um, number four, uh, the Muslim okay. Muslim ticket. Uh, <laughs> Pastor Sonny, just calm down. Let me just use this okay. moment because, because I've not had Cheta for a long while. So I'll be brief. The Muslim Muslim ticket has brought to light a little thing with regards to a conspiracy theory of um, an Islamization agenda in Nigeria. Uh, do you think that exists? And if we ought to have a country that functions, should we not be discussing a referendum for either restructuring? And of course, you have the position that we are better together. So going our separate paths, we just compound the issues. And so what are your takes with that? Because sometimes issues that has to do with like the water bill, grazing bill and the rest of that, and this present administration um, award in nepotism, do you think that Nigeria, as a matter of fact, will function better if we are able to agree in a referendum? Thank you, Cheta. Okay, thank you. I will send an invoice to you after all these questions. <laughs> um, I would answer the, I will answer the first one last. So let me, ask, let me go through the others. Um, for the COP uh, press conference about the voter register, I followed that um, and I wasn't surprised. Um, I'm of the opinion that the whole idea behind voters register is flawed. Once we fixed our identity management system, any citizen ought to be able to vote. Anybody, since we, we've opted to use universal suffrage, everybody who is 18 and above should be able to vote upon presentation of your name card, your, your national identity management card. Um, we should be concerned because yes, one thing that we must understand is that there will be efforts to, um, to massage the elections. <laughs> Let's just use that um, expression. Um, and we should, it's not something that we should be ex we should be surprised about. People will act based on incentives. So people are acting based on incentives. Our job as a people is to be vigilant about it and prevent what's, um, uh, uh, what we are afraid of. On whether the elections may hold, um, I think the elections will hold. I think that the political class is is united on that, that power um, has to shift from the person of Muhammad Buhari. I think even Buhari himself is, is tired of, and he's just, he's just marking time. He just wants to get, get out of there. Um, so I think the elections will hold. However, um, because of our security issues and other allied issues, infrastructural, beavers may fail and all of that stuff, we are going to see, I'm almost certain that this election will be challenged in courts. Um, in 2019, there was, a, in the town of Gaidem in Yobe State, there was a Boko Haram attack the day before. 
um, and 120 people uh, thereabouts were killed. Yet, they then produced results with a with about a 90% turnout. That is statistically impossible. I think people will be more prepared to challenge things like that in this particular election. On the Muslim Muslim tickets, whether there's a conspiracy, I don't think that there's a conspiracy where people sat down to say, oh, we must Islamize Nigeria. However, and this brings us back to what I said from the beginning. 30 years ago, there was a Muslim Muslim ticket and Nigerians voted for it. But 30 years ago, Nigeria was not as hateful or resource starved or choked up as it is now. So now there's every reason for mistrust. More and more people do not trust the system. So it will show up in resistance to things like a Muslim Muslim ticket. I think that the APC ought to have been aware of that because a lot of Christians, myself included, um, I'm, I mean, I grew up as a Catholic and not only was I a Catholic, I was a mass server, I was an altar boy. So I'm fully aware of the fact that there are certain garments, certain vestments that cannot be worn in certain locations, certain colors that are worn at certain times of the year. When I saw that um, video, that image of some so-called bishops coming to endorse the uh, APC candidates at, uh, at um, the Yeradua Center in Abuja, I, I felt personally offended. There are more people, there are people who are far more religious than I am who would feel even more offended than that. So you have, for a country as diverse and divided as ours, you must take into account people's sensitivities. It's, it's not negotiable. Which brings us to a referendum. I think that we need a referendum at some point. We need, but we need it after a discussion. You don't just get up and do a referendum. You need to have a proper discussion and then vote on the issues discussed. I'm of the opinion, I believe that Nigeria should not be divided, but I think that all the conferences that we've had, where we say, where we begin the conference by saying Nigeria's unity is not up for discussion, I think it's, it, that's a flawed approach. Nigeria needs to win the arguments. If we can have a situation where genuine representatives of the people are locked in a room, people trust them that, okay, this guy is going to go there and discuss up for my interest in good faith. If we have such a well, conference, well, if we have such a conference and such things are discussed and everything is is um, is 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 discussed and trashed out, and we win the arguments, you will find that Nigeria will actually emerge from such a situation stronger. But as long as we keep putting constraints, we keep putting, say, no, you can't talk about this, no, you can't, people will, even though they may not say it publicly, they will ask why. Finally, on my view of the major contenders, one by one, um, I think that, let's start with Peter Obi. He's the most uh, he's the most popular candidate at the moment, as, especially among the chattering classes. Peter Obi will not be able to do something that is essential in Nigeria, which is to run a government by consensus. Peter Obi is a is a self made man, and like most self made men, he's given to that hubris that I have done this before. His administration in Anambra showed it many times he went on his own in and to be fair to him in most of those occasions he got it right but in a nigeria that you now have the added layers of ethnic mistrust and religious mistrust it will lead to social unrest very quickly we must always remember that anambra state is number one almost 100 percent Igbo, and number two overwhelmingly Catholic, even though they have that issue of Isemoku Fadana CMS, which is uh, an Igbo thing that talks about the, the problem between the Catholic and Anglican church. But that is Peter Obi's main, uh, the thing that goes against him in my view. For the other two candidates, the first problem both of them have is age. We can't run from it. Bola Tinubu is clearly not very, very well. Um, Atiku Abubakar looks very detached. And then we've talked about the Muslim Muslim thing, which is the which is the issue with Bola Tinubu's candidacy. For the Atiku Abubakar candidacy, you can't avoid that whole 
power has been with the north for eight years in Buhari, and mm-hmm. then it's moving, it's, uh, it's still staying with the north. Precedence is a very strong thing. If we do that, then there's nothing preventing some other northerner from coming in uh, in eight years' time or four years' time, whichever it is, to say that, oh, it doesn't matter. So these are the, um, the, the and then, oh, finally, another thing about Peter Obi candidacy is the Labour Party is not as strong as the other two. So with a Peter Obi presidency, we run the real risk of having um, having obstruction at the, at the legislative level. That is also problematic. I hope I've answered all your questions. Thank you very, very much. Thank you indeed. Uh, you have answered most of our questions. Are there any other questions on the platform? Any other person question? Or oh, Sonny, Jumoke, do you have any things you want to chip in before I ask our great guest to give his closing remarks? Also, I think you can go ahead with the closing remarks. Uh, just go ahead. No question more from my side. <laughs> Is Samuel Dada putting up his hands, or is this an I, old? I, I think he is, but we can't afford to take more questions, to be honest. Um, maybe you can send the questions in the chat, and then we'll be able to get. Oh, Pastor, it's your decision anyway. Let me leave that to you. <laughs> no, I think you've spoken now. I'm not going to contradict what you've said. Um, I think we want to try and end these matters within a given time slot so that people can do other things. Yeah. Uh, Cheetah, thank you so much for um, obliging us and being on this conversation. I think we're very, very enriched with a lot of your answers and um, your thoughts, your deep thoughts on uh, the Nigerian issue. But out of the three, or oh, is it four? You left out Kwakwan, so you didn't quite land on any. You just gave up and down, up and down, up and down. You didn't land. Are you, can we box you to land or you want to plead the Fifth Amendment or you're going to do that after the Queen's funeral? <laughs> um, the Fifth Amendment is something that I'm not, like, I'm not entitled to being that I'm not an American citizen. Um, my escape route, and I'm going to take it, is the fact that um, given the nature of the job that I do, I cannot vote. Um, we have to be um we have to be we have to not just be neutral but seem to be neutral so i'll use that as an escape route to say that i that i will not since i'm not going to vote um next year um, because we're going to be involved in election monitoring at, at a level so i can um i'll just stand aside um but as to kwankwaso kwankwaso is um, is the outsider in the in the entire race he's not he's not a factor um one of my own personal fears is that We've, we are back to the 1979 and 1964 scenario where somebody from each of the so-called three major ethnic groups is at the head of a significant ticket. And um, I fear for uh, each time that that happened, it didn't end well. Um, informal, informal polling that we've already conducted shows that um, people, people are beginning to default to their ethnic um, silos. That is problematic. That is problematic. Thank you very much. Any other class closing words, or do we take this as your final words on this matter? And I'll tell Kwakan so that you are not his friend. <laughs> <laughs> we call him now and say he has you are not his friend. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah. Any other closing um, words? Please? Well, my closing, my closing words is that um. Nigeria was created without our inputs, but we've lived with it for 108 years now. Um, And we've lived with it, we've interacted, we've intermarried, we've built structures. Um, Again, I give myself as an example. I'm 42 years old. In that period, I have not slept for more than, for a combined total of more than three years in what is supposed to be my ancestral hometown. That brings up the question of, am I really from there? And I'm not the only one. There are so many like me. Um, We need to build a country that works. I think that's, and I'm going to include this from a slightly racial angle. I think that the failure of Nigeria thus far has impacted 
all black people around the world. We need, to, we, we actually have a historical burden on us to make it work. So we need to make it work. But to make it work, we need to two things. Number one, we need to, we need to learn how to have difficult conversations. And number two, we need to trace where the rain started beating us. Once we know where the rain started beating us, then we'll be able to know where to take cover. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very, very much, Jita. Thank you so much for being on the platform. Thank you for your work. Thank you for the amount of energy and effort and study that you have put into this whole process. Uh, we are very, very appreciative and we don't take it for granted at all. Um, we look forward to further engagements uh, and to also getting some more input from you, even as you do your work to ensure that we have credible elections in Nigeria. Uh, please try and make sure that in your, in your watch over the elections, you people stand strong, you stand firm, you don't allow any kind of election malpractice or any malfeasance in the elections. The least we can try and do in Nigeria is to have credible elections that we can all say are reasonably credible. We don't want anybody stealing, snatching, or manipulating. Please try and help us see to that with your colleagues. I will be very grateful. I want to thank everybody that has been on the platform. I want to thank especially my sister, I'm thanking you for today. I'm thanking you for yesterday and last two weekends, uh, Her Excellency, Mrs. Obioma Liel Imoke, the wife of the former governor of Cross River State. Please thank my brother Liel for me. It was great to see him. I want to thank everybody also for coming. If you can get us uh, Ashiwaju, Atiku, Kwakwanso, Kachiku, Abiola, any other presidential candidate, please let us know. We would like to talk to them and engage them and get their own point of view as to what is going on in our great country. Or if there's anybody you think has a great opinion on Nigeria and how to move this thing forward, we'd like to talk to the person also. But our focus in the next few months, obviously, will be on 2023. How do we get it right? And how do we analyze these candidates, all 16 of them or 15 of them? And how do we hopefully settle on the best of the lot? We may not have the best, best for Nigeria, but at least we can have the best of the lot. I think that really is what the competition is now. How do we get the best of the lot and then take it from there and see where God takes us? Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you very much. Our guest today, Chita, God be with you and God strengthen you. Thank you very God much. Bless you. Chita, can you share your social media handle? People are asking, do you want to get in touch? Okay. Stephen, Ipalibo, thank you very much for making this connection with Chita. Thank you, I'm very grateful to you, Stephen. All right, bye. Bambo, great to see you as always. Good, Anyao, great to see you. Bambo, I'm coming back to London soon. <laughs> <laughs>